And thank you for coming to Cerritos uh, Multinational Church of the Nazarene. Those who are here and those who are there, thanks for being a part of our service. Um, we're going to be doing what we usually do. We're just finishing up answering some questions. Uh, remember that every Sunday afternoon at 4.45, um, we have a question and answer session where we answer questions about the Bible and we answer questions about the Christian faith. And so uh, bring your paper and your pen and you know, bring your questions and uh, I'll take a look at them and I'll laugh and I won't answer any of them. No, no, I, uh, we're, we're just <laughs> finishing answering questions and we're going to sing in a little while too. But uh, did, that, did that answer that question for you? Very good. Sure. Anything else? Well, let's sing a little bit. The Lord loves our singing. And by the way, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So when we sing to him, he's in there singing along too. He just, he just lives in the praises of his people. So that's a nice way of guaranteeing that his presence is here. Come with me. my glasses so that I can see this time. Sorry for the dead airspace. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children.
Well, let's see. Do I see glory on each face? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of glory in here. That's good. Okay. Always, it's always a joy to me to, to come and get a chance to worship with you, to get a chance to study with you. Um, that's what Sunday nights is all about. And I highly recommend coming live when you're able to. And um, nice to have those of you who are live here. Um, we're going we're gonna to study from the book of Luke. We're going to chip away at a couple of chapters, hopefully. Luke chapter 7. But first, a word to our sponsor. <laughs> Father, we thank you for being present here. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. We can feel your mighty power and your grace. Lord, we can almost hear that brush of angels' wings. We do see glory on each face. Surely your presence is here. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who desires to teach us, who desires to comfort us, who desires to be our constant companion. And Lord, I pray that we will we'll be cognizant of that, that we'll be aware of the, the presence of the Lord all the time in our lives. Lord, that as we get up in the morning, we'll say, oh, good morning, Lord, because we know that you're there. And that you're there with us throughout the day, throughout the night, that you don't leave even when we're asleep. We thank you, Father, for your, for your love for us. It's hard to understand because sometimes we don't even love ourselves very much. But you love us because you are love. And I thank you, God, for your word this evening. I pray that you will do the teaching yourself. Once again, that you'll just take me out of the equation and that you will glorify yourself. And all that's done tonight, may we leave different than we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 7. Should I swallow my gum? If I do, I probably shouldn't tell you. I probably shouldn't have even gone this far. <laughs> Chapter 7 of Luke. Now, when he concluded all his sayings, talking, of course, about Jesus, when he concluded all of his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Capernaum, by the way, is Jesus' headquarters. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. It's interesting that the centurion just didn't feel worthy of having, uh, having Jesus come to his house. There, there are essentially two kinds of people in this world. <laughs> there are Jews 
and there are Gentiles. And the centurion was a Gentile. And he knew that Jews really could not, according to the traditions of the Jewish law, they could not legally go into the house of a centurion, of any Gentile. So what did he do? What did the centurion do when he heard about Jesus? He sent elders of the Jews to Jesus, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. When they, when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was a deserving person. For he loves our nation and he has built us a synagogue. This guy was a special centurion. As a centurion, he was a Roman soldier, but he was a, he was a different breed. He was, uh, he was kind. He was, uh, he was amicable toward the Jews and ha had helped in the building of a synagogue for them. So he loved the Jewish people. And so apparently he was comfortable enough in asking the favor from Jesus to come and heal his servant. It's interesting to me also that he loved his servant. This is a person who was dear to him. Not everybody loves their employees. But uh, that's, that's really a, a worthwhile attitude. If you are an employer, as I am, love your people. Um, but when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying the one was deserving. He loves our nation. He has built us a synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And then he was, when he was not far away from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I'm just not worthy that you should come into my house. So he's still concerned about that, about that thing. Lord, you're not supposed to come into the house of a Gentile, let alone a, you know, a centurion. And uh, so don't, don't trouble yourself. I'm not worthy to have you come. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. That's why he sent elders of the Jews to, to Jesus. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, that was already an act of faith. We were talking about faith in the question and answer session. This, this fellow is exercising faith, saying, if you just say the word, my servant will be healed. And he could have stopped there, and the Lord would have healed a servant. But he went on. He said, for I also am a man placed under authority. I have soldiers under me. And when I say to one, go, he goes. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard those things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. In other words, among the Jews. This dude is a Gentile. But I haven't found this kind of faith even among the Jews. Now, how, how was that? I understand how the first Satan statement was uh, an exercise of faith. Lord, you know, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just say the word and he'll be healed. Okay? Belief that the Lord could do it. And the belief that the Lord would do it. But what he said after that is fascinating. I'm also a man placed under authority. He knew that Jesus had authority over life and death. All you have to do is say the word and he'll be, he'll be healed because I, I have people under my authority and when I tell a soldier come or I tell a soldier to go, they come and they go. They, they do what I want because I have authority over them. And to notice, for a Gentile to notice that Jesus had authority over those things. Let's go on. Verse 10, And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant was, who was well. And uh, now it happened the day after that, he went, Jesus went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him. Nain was probably less than 30 miles away. And many of his disciples went with him, and a large crowd went with him. And when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. Um, could you uh, 
Could you put up that next uh, slide there? Uh, let's go beyond this one. Is this the dead man being carried out? Yep, it is. So he, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. Now, picture, this, picture the scene. You know, this is always good to do when you're reading the uh, passage in the Bible. Put yourself in the picture. They're, they're mourning. They're carrying this guy out. People are crying. His mother is crying. She was a widow. This is her only son. So th that w there wasn't anything else left in the world for her. She had no husband. Now she had no son. Absolutely desperate. Just in terrible despair. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion. Now, could you go back to the slide before this? He had compassion on her. And the word that is translated compassion is a word that we can't really do. We can't do justice for in, uh, in English. Uh, the, you see what the, what the Greek word is, uh, splagnitsomai. But the um, a compassion meant to the moving of his insides. That's literally what the word means. To the moving of his heart. Now, in our, in our society, when somebody, oh, I love you with all my heart, in those days, they would be more likely to say, I love you with all my bowels. That was, uh, that was, so literally, splagnitsomai is the, uh, a, a moving of compassion all the way to the bowels. Just a tremendous, uh, a tremendous love that Jesus had for her, a, a huge compassion that he had for her. He knew the situation she was in. He knew that this was her only son. And so he had tremendous compassion on her and he said, don't weep. Now, I, I know, um, I, I've heard enough, uh, enough <laughs> uh, psychoanalysts, shall we say, who uh, tell people when somebody is crying or somebody is unhappy, they say, don't say to them, oh, don't be unhappy, don't cry. Well, you know what? <laughs> Jesus did. He said, don't cry. But he knew what he was going to do. Then he came and he touched the open coffin and those who carried the, the dead young man stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. Now, when he spoke to the young man, was he dead or alive? Yeah, his body, I mean, they knew he was dead. They were carrying him out to... Uh, uh, what they would actually do is they would wrap the body in a lime kind of uh, substance, a, a sarcophagus kind of thing. And uh, the word sarcophagus, by the way, means flesh eater because this lime substance that they would put on the cloth would literally eat away the, the flesh in just a short amount of time. Uh, so instead of taking, you know, 20, 30 years to decompose, it would decompose fast. It would eat away the flesh. And then after that time that, the, you know, that he's down to bones, they would take the bones and they would, uh, uh, they would bury them in what's called an ossuary, um, a bone die. People who love Jesus, who have accepted him, do not die. Jesus said they don't. But people who have rejected Jesus, wicked people, also don't die. They, they go immediately to a place of torment. And so <coughs> this young man, his spirit was alive and he could hear him quite well. And so his spirit entered back into the body, back into the body, and he, uh, and he came, 
came back to physical life. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you... <laughs> If this coughing goes on for more than an hour, then uh, this will be a really long service. Uh, the, the question was a good one. When you touch a dead person, don't you become unclean? And according to Jewish law, yes, you become ceremonially unclean. Jesus didn't honor those traditions very much. When you touch a leper, you become ceremonially unclean. And so what did he often do with lepers? Held out his hand, touched him, and they would become clean. Now, here's the deal. Is it really going against Jewish law because once Jesus touches the person, they're not unclean anymore. They're healed. This young man came back to life. He wasn't a dead person. And so uh, it's, it's, a matter of, uh, it's a matter of amazing timing. But uh, you're absolutely right in your assumption. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak. And, he, and Jesus presented him to his mother. How do you think the crowd took this? Fear. <laughs> They knew he was dead. They, you know, they saw him being placed in the coffin. He was dead in a doornail. And now he's sitting up and he's talking. Well, I don't know about you, but that, that'd be a little unusual. You know, it's like one of those stories where, that you always hear from people who drive a hearse. And uh, you know, when sometimes the, the body is in the hearse. It's not in a, it's not in a coffin yet. And... Oh, it's a red light. And the guy hits the brakes and his body comes up over the seat, you know. That had to be about what they felt like. Only this one was alive. So the Lord presented him to his mother and fear came upon everybody and they glorified God saying, a great that has risen up among us and God has visited his people. It's an interesting comment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it totally depends on the on the translation. the The New King James said that they they were fearful. Um, and l let's take a minute on that because that's a good subject. In the book of Proverbs and several places in Psalms and several different places, it says, "The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom." The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, God wants us to call him his father. Should I be afraid of my father? I know some people in this society are afraid of their father and for good reason, but they shouldn't be. A person shouldn't fear someone who loves them. They shouldn't fear someone they love. And so the fear of God as the beginning of wisdom means exactly what she said. It's the awe of God. We should never get so, and I want to be careful how I say this, we should never get so buddy-buddy um, with God that we lose that awe of who he is. Now, do I believe that we ought to be friendly with him? I believe we ought to be friendly. I, I've told you many times, I believe that the Lord plays games with me at certain times, you know. I, um, I believe that he kind of plays chess with people, moving them around. I believe that he loves to show off for his people. But we should never get so <clears throat> dangerously familiar that we lose that awe-inspiring a realization for who God is. God made quintillions of quintillions of stars. He's a, he's a creator. 
So he made this vast universe and then all, he came all the way down and he, then he made the little tiny electrons that you know, go, around the, go around the nucleus of an atom. He made from the big to the small and understands, it, and understands all of it. He understands the intricacies of the human mind, which we don't understand. He's God. He's astounding. He's amazing. Um, if you want to see how amazing he is, you know, thumb through and read through Job 38 and 39. When God tells how amazing he is. We should never lose that. So fear and awe in this case are, are really the same idea. And that was a good point. You think word got around? I don't know who this guy is, but he just raised some dead guy, and I knew the guy was dead. He just ra- and the guy sat up, and he started talking, and he went back to his mom. Uh, <laughs> that'd be a trip, you know. That's exactly what happened. And so, verse 17, the report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Then the disciples of John, this would be John the Baptist, The disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. Now, where was John? He was in jail. (laughs) He was in prison. Herod, you know, we've talked about the story. I'm not going to tell it again. But uh, John had chided uh, Herod for immorality. And so Herod had him thrown in prison. You don't say those things to the king. Goodbye. Goodbye. And he sent him off to prison. And Herod actually liked John. But he did that because his wife really insisted. And so um, there he is in, in prison. And John called two of his disciples to him. And he sent them to Jesus saying, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? See, John knew his scriptures. John the Baptist knew the Old Testament. That was all the scriptures that there were at this time. There were no New Testament at this time. So John knew his scriptures. He knew from the book of Deuteronomy that there was going to be somebody coming who was sort of like Moses, it said. He knew that there was a great prophet who was going to be coming. He knew from Isaiah that there was going to be a child coming who would be the king of kings. He knew, he knew these scriptures. So he knew somebody was coming. And remember what John himself had said when he was baptizing people and Jesus came walking up. What did he say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew who Jesus was. But sometimes when your situation gets really ugly in life, You get discouraged and you think, you know, is this stuff for real? Are you really the one or should we wait for somebody else? When the men had come to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour he cured many infirmities. Now this is verses and not in here by accident. At that very time, Jesus healed a lot of sicknesses. He drove out a lot of evil spirits, healed afflictions. He gave sight to the blind. Jesus did a bunch of miracles. You think that was a mistake that this person has put in there right after John said, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And then it says he did a lot of miracles. And now Jesus answers the question. He said, go and tell John the things that you have seen and heard. The blind see. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. The poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who, has, who does not stumble because of me. Now, why did he say all those things? Because he knew that John knew the scriptures. John knew Isaiah chapter 35, which says those things. The blind see, the lame walk. And and it's speaking about the coming Messiah. 
And so Jesus said, well, look, this is what's happening. He didn't have to say, yes, I'm the one. Jesus took him back to Scripture. That's a good example for us. When we get discouraged, when things get difficult in life, and I didn't say if. Is there anybody in here that's never had a difficult time in your life? Let's see your hands there. Uh, let's count them. Oh, yeah, zero. Okay. Um, everybody's had difficult times in their lives. When that happens, where's the best place to go? Right here. Go to Scripture. When you're tempted, go to Scripture. When you're sad, go to Scripture. And if you know your Scripture well enough, you know where to go. When you're discouraged, read a psalm. When, when you're hurting, read the book of Job. When you wonder if God is powerful enough to take care of your problems, read Job 38. Just if you know your Scriptures enough so that you know where to go, then... Uh, it's amazing how much they help with whatever situations we're in. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak to the multitudes concerning John. Now, Jesus used this as an object lesson. John come and asked this question. He sent the, John's disciples back, and he said, By the way, what did you go into the wilderness to see? Just a, a blabbermouth? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who are gorgeously appareled and live in luxury, are th those people are in king's courts. He wasn't in a king's court. He was out in the wilderness. He was all dressed in camel fur and he was eating wild locusts. That's probably real low on my list of favorite things to eat. So he was living a very ascetic life. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Now Jesus got and gets to the point. He said, yeah, he's a prophet. And he was more than a prophet. Now, there's some interesting comparison coming in here. This is he of whom it is written, and this is in Isaiah, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Who's the you in that sentence? It's Jehovah. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Pre he was preparing the way for Jehovah to come. Does that leave any doubt at all that Jesus the Messiah is himself Jehovah God. Does that leave any possible doubt? No. But what does Jesus say about John the Baptist? For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Really? Let's see. Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Zechariah, Hosea, all of those people... Nobody greater than John the Baptist. He really thought pretty highly of John. Why? Because John actually announced the coming of the Messiah the day he came to be baptized. Then Jesus says more. Very surprising statement. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Ponder on that for a minute. He who is least in the kingdom of God, the lowest person on the totem pole of Christians, is greater than the highest person on the totem pole of prophets, the Old Testament prophets. Why? John the Baptist is written about in the New Testament. But was he a New Testament prophet or an Old Testament prophet? He was actually an Old Testament prophet because he was preaching repentance and, and preaching baptism for the remission of sins. Uh, he obeyed the sacrifice laws. He was an Old Testament prophet. His story is told about in the New Testament because he lived at the same time as Jesus. 
But he was an Old Testament prophet. And Jesus is saying, those who have received me, even the least of those, is greater than all those for whom the gospel had not, uh, had not come. Isn't that astounding? Let's go on. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. The people were big believers in John the Baptist. They didn't know who he was, spiritually speaking, but they were big believers in him. And the Lord said, but the Pharisees, verse 30, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by John. We don't believe in the baptism of John. We have no interest in this thing. There's probably no Messiah coming. Pharisees, we're the top of the food chain. And they rejected the will of God. And the Lord said, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are, what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We cried for you and you didn't weep. Now what does he mean by that? It means nothing satisfies these people. That's what this generation is like. We play music for you and you don't sing and dance. We weep for you and you don't weep. There's nothing that satisfies you people. That's what the generation was like. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. And you say, oh, he has a demon. This guy's strange. Camel hair and locusts and uh, the guy's just weird. And so they said he had a demon. He came, he didn't eat bread, he didn't drink wine. But then he said, I come to you and I do eat bread and I do drink wine and I get together with tax collectors and sinners and you say, this guy is a glutton and a wine bibber. So you're never happy. One guy comes to you, he's totally ascetic. Another guy comes to you and, well, he's a glutton. <laughs> what do you want? They couldn't be satisfied. And then verse 35 but wisdom is justified by all her children. Actually, literally, wisdom is justified by her deeds. See, Jesus knew that his deeds proved his relationship with God. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him crying. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he probably thought, Oh, what a, what a sweet gesture. She's being kind to, not exactly what he, this Pharisee said. If this guy had any spiritual wisdom at all, he'd know that the woman wiping his feet is a wicked woman. He's not for real. He doesn't even know what kind of a woman this is. But do you think Jesus knew what the guy was thinking? The guy's name was Simon, by the way, the Pharisee. Jesus knew what he was thinking. And Jesus said, Simon, I have something to say to you. So Simon said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, meaning uh, the amount that people would be paid in about a year and a half. And the other owed 50 denarii. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both their debt. Isn't that cool? Forgave them both the debt. You don't owe me anything. 
So Jesus said, Simon, tell me, which of them will love that master more? The one who owed a little bit or the one who owed a lot? Simon didn't have to think about it at all. He answered and said, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And Jesus said, you're right. And then he turned to the woman and he said to, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no greeting kiss. This woman hasn't ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil. This woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. How do you think that went over? Same way it's gone over all the other times. Those who sat at the table with him began to say, who's this dude that forgives sins? Only God can forgive sins. And then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It takes faith to be saved. But that faith comes from God. He gives us the ability to be saved, but we have to say yes. We have to receive him. Chapter 8. Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and uh, Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. So you see the picture is that these women loved Jesus. They had been forgiven of their sins. And so they were kind of following him around. They were disciples of Jesus following him around. And uh, if Jesus needed food, well, here, let, uh, Susanna, why don't you go, your house is nearby, why don't you go fix him something? Oh, le, uh, let's go into the marketplace and we'll buy you, uh, buy you some food. They would supply the needs for the disciples out of their own, out of their own resources. Now, verse 4. When a great multitude had gathered and they had come to him from every city, he spoke with a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock. And as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop of a hundredfold, a hundred times. And when he had said these things, he cried out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's something that Jesus said a number of times uh, in the book of Revelation too. You remember that he wrote this, uh, he dictated seven letters to John the disciple John, and John wrote the book of Revelation. Well, the chapters two and three contain those seven letters that Jesus dictated. And over and over he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's what he's saying here. Now, everybody has ears. Uh, Vincent Van Gogh had one. You know. But everybody has ears. And... Most people can hear. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, if you are open, then here's, here's the reality of it so you can get it, if you're open. But why did he speak to people in parables? Why didn't he just make everything clear and everybody would accept the gospel and that'd be it? 
It doesn't work that way, does it? Many people reject the gospel. Pastor talked about it this morning. Wide is the road that leads to destruction, and many there be who go thereon, but narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be who find it. Why? People reject the gospel. So the next time you witness to somebody and they do reject you, you're in, you're in pretty super company. They rejected Jesus too. They rejected him so badly that they had the Romans nail him on a cross. I mean, they, they brutally rejected the gospel that Jesus taught. But some of them found it. They had ears to hear. They wanted to hear the gospel. It seems that people who are the most needy are often the most open. That's why Jesus said it's very hard for wealthy people to, um, to be saved. But it's possible. It's possible. Just ask Abraham, Solomon, David, um, Job. Let's go on. Jesus said, verse 10, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He's talking to his disciples now. But to the rest of the people, it's given in parables. Why? That seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, does that mean that it was Jesus' Jesus' will that they just not get it? No. They see, but they don't see. They hear it, but they don't understand. Why? Because Satan has hardened their hearts. Satan has deceived them. Jesus explains the parable now for his disciples. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. We've talked about the fact that birds represent evil in Scripture. And the birds in the, in the parable represents the devil come and stealing away the seed. So he steals it away and it doesn't take any root. But the ones on the rock, some seed fell on rocky ground, that's those people when they hear it, they receive the word for joy. Yay! Yay, I'm saved. And they float back to their seat from the altar, you know. And then the next day, their, uh, their old evil friends come along and say, Hey, Henry, come on. Let's, uh, let's go do what we always do. Okay. <laughs> and there's no change. Why? They heard the word. They got it. But they didn't receive him. It says they received it with joy, but they didn't repent. They didn't receive him. They didn't believe the word. And so it wasn't real for them. Now the ones that fell upon thorns, those are the people that when they heard, they go out, but they're choked out by the cares of this world, riches and pleasures of life. And so they don't bear any fruit. We're talking about fruit. Those love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, you know, all of those, those things. Well, there's fruit that a person can bear in their lives. And other people can see it. The Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. So other people can, can see when you have, those, uh, uh, have the fruit. But the problem is that they got choked out by pleasures and riches and... All of those things. So they didn't bring any fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good soil, they had ears to hear and they heard. They saw and they got it. Well, those people 
accept it with a noble and a good heart and they keep it and they bear fruit with patience. No one, when he has, and, and this is part of the same discussion, nobody, when he has a light lit, covers it up with a, with a you know, a basket. Well, trust me, there's, there's a light under there. It's probably just going to burn the basket. You know? just, <laughs> they don't cover it up with a vessel. When you've got a light, you let it shine. That's what Christians do. Does, any, does that remind anybody of an old Sunday school song? Yeah, me too. Okay. But he sets it on a lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. We're to, we're to show God's glory in the way that we live. And so, verse 18, Therefore, watch out how you hear. Take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. Person gets it, God's going to give him more understanding. But to those who don't have, even what they think they have is going to be taken away. Yes, I understand the Bible. I've read through it many times. I've heard people say this. I've read through the Bible several times. They saw it, but they didn't see it. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to him. Yes, he did have brothers and sisters, by the way. And could not approach him because of the crowd. And it was told him by some, hey, your mom and your brothers are standing outside. They want to see you. And he answered them and said, my mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. That was not a disrespectful comment about his mother and his family. He's just saying, here's my family. If, if you've received him, you've heard the word of God and you do his word, you're Jesus' brother, you're Jesus' mother, you're his family. It's good to know, isn't it? As we said a couple of weeks ago, your heirs, oh, I said last week, Sunday morning, your heirs of the promise. They belong to you because you're your family. Now, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples. And he said to them, let's cross over to the other side. And they launched out. But as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake and they were, <laughs> the boats were filling with water and they were in deep yogurt. Jeopardy. They were in trouble. Boats filling with water. And they came to Jesus and said, Master, Master, we're dying. And so he got up. He told the wind to be silent and he told the water to be still. And immediately there was a great calm. But he said to them, Que pasó? Where's your faith? What happened? Now why would he say that? They were, they were afraid of dying there in the boat. Whenever anybody's boat is filling up with water, they're afraid of dying. It was natural, right? But wait a minute. What would faith have said? Wait a minute. He said at the beginning, let's go across to the other side of the lake. He did not say, let's go under the lake. <laughs> he, he didn't say, let's go die on the lake. He said, let's cross over to the other side. So Jesus had told them they were going to cross over safely. And that was the faith problem. They should have known that they were not in danger. But then they wondered. I mean, these are the people that hung around with him all the time, his disciples, right? Who can this be that even the wind and the waves obey him? Wind doesn't have ears. Waves don't have eyes. And yet they hear him and they obey him. 
Jesus is master of everything. All things were created for his glory. All things were created for his pleasure, including you and me were created for his pleasure. He has control over everything. Sometimes when we look at this world, it doesn't seem like it. Lord, looks like you're out of control right now. No, he's not out of control. Satan is being allowed to do his thing because God's putting together a family. A family of people who reject the works of Satan and receive the gospel of Christ. He's putting together a family. So they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite to Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there he met a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes. This, the demon-possessed man was naked. And he didn't live in a house, but he, he lived among the tombs. They're in a cemetery. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to you? What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High? Demons know exactly who Jesus is because they used to live with him in heaven. They know exactly who Jesus is, son of the Most High. What do we have to do with you? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he'd just break the chains and shackles because demons have a lot of power, right? And Jesus asked the, the demon, what is your name? And he said, legion, because we are many. This guy was in a lot of trouble. A lot of demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Next, uh, next slide there, Merle. The word for abyss in Greek is the word abuso. It even sounds like abyss. It's the place of, uh, it's a place of torment in the heart of the earth. So I suppose someplace on earth there's this shaft, you know, that leads down to this place. It's probably in New Mexico. I don't know where it is. But th those of you who don't know, I grew up in New Mexico, so I, s I know of what I speak. <laughs> but, but this abyss was a place for evil people who had rejected God and rejected the prophets. But it's also for evil demons. The most fierce of the demons were imprisoned down there. Now they're going to be led out according to the book of Revelation. They're going to be led out uh, on one day when Satan is also let out of prison one day after he's been bound up for a thousand years. We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation. But right now they're in prison. And these demons are saying, please don't send us there with the other guys. So Jesus said, fine. And he drove them into a herd of swine. And these swine now being crazed by the demons inside them, jumped off a cliff and went into the water and drowned. A couple thousand of them. Now, what happened to the economy of Gadara, the Gadarenes, the economy of Gadara, when there were people who made money by selling pork chops, selling ham, selling bacon. They weren't supposed to do that. It was against Jewish law, but they didn't care. They had rejected it. And so their, their livelihood went down the tubes. And so they were upset. And they asked Jesus to leave because Jesus had healed the man. And now he went out, he got dressed, He's sitting there at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And the people around him, they were terrified. 
But the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadarenes, verse 37, asked him to leave there because they were seized with great fear and also because he had destroyed their pig economy. So he got back into the boat and he returned. The man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. Lord, let me, let me stay with you. But Jesus said, no, go return to your own house. Tell everybody what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and he proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. So, Jesus encounters the town of Gadara. By the way, those who believe that uh, many of the towns that are mentioned in the Bible are mythical, it's just been a few decades now that the town of Gadara has been found archaeologically. Once, once again, the Bible is true and uh, many people who, uh, who disbelieve it are false. But it's, it's a joy to me when I see that the secular world proves the Bible is true. We don't need proof that the Bible is true because the Holy Spirit does that for us. He shows us that the Bible is true. But it's kind of cool when the world realizes, oh my gosh, the Bible is true came true again, over and over. Trust in this word. Believe it, learn it, memorize, memorize some of it. Know where things are, it'll help you in a time of trouble. That's good news, isn't it? We're going to see him in all of his glory. Praise God. Thank you very much, Merle. Thank you very much, Lee, for making this all possible. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus, whom we are going to see someday. Amen. Have a good night.